This is the Pacific. This was their blueprint. Carefully planned, ruthlessly executed, bluntly reversed. Behind our stepping stones, some captured, some bypassed. The Solomons, Bougainville, New Britain, the Gilberts, Macon, and Tarawa, the Marshalls, Aini We Talk. Quadruline. Isolated are Rabal, the Carolines, and Truck, former nightmare of the Central Pacific. But one more step is needed to provide bases within bombing distance of Tokyo. The Marianas are a must. Here is your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. I have always considered Saipan the decisive battle of the Pacific offense. Iwo Jima and Okinawa were costlier, but their capture was made possible by Saipan, which breached Japan's inner defense circles, destroyed the main bastions, and opened the way to the home island. Equally important was the psychological effect, for the crushing defeat at Saipan carried the Tojo cabinet into the discard. For the first time, the Japanese nation was told that the American forces were perilously close to their homeland. But the real zest for its capture came from the knowledge that Admiral Nagumo, who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, was there. The softening up process begins as the big boys of the Far Eastern Air Force drop 2,500,000 pounds of bombs. Battleships fire salvos into the area of Tanapad. 6,000 tons of steel. 100,000 40 millimeter shells. 70,000 rounds from the big guns. 12 million pounds of punishment. LCVPs move toward the beach. 5,000 yards from shore, they turn, retrace their steps. They are empty of landing troops. This has been a diversion. 1,000 enemy forces spread out, so they cannot concentrate on our real objective. The sky is ours. Four days ago, a 225-plane fighter sweep of carrier-based aircraft surprised the Japanese in the Marianas and destroyed 150 in the air and on the ground. As our first waves of Amtrak's near the beach, the planes moved their points of aim inland, maintaining a 100-yard area of minimum safety between us and their explosion. The Japanese play no favorite. Their artillery, mortar, machine gun, 75 millimeter and small arms fire is everywhere. All four assault battalion commanders of the 2nd Marine Division become casualties in very short hours. On Red Beach, the 6th Marines suffer heavy losses. Some wounded waiting for evacuation become twice wounded. An abandoned enemy tank suddenly comes to life. Scores repeated hits on following waves of Amtrak. On Green Beach, a Fetna Point, the 8th Marines come up against a series of enemy pillboxes. On Yellow Beach, at a Gingan point, the 4th Marine Division catches it. Our wrecked Amtrak congesting the beach plus enemy action force the withdrawal of the LVTs. 
carrying with them many machine guns and much ammunition and equipment. We will be short of communications equipment for three days. Enemy 75s fire at us from the front. Two bypass mortars from the rear. Planes silence the mortar. LVTAs from the Army's 708th Amphibian Tank Battalion act as decoys, saving many of the Marines in the troop-laden Amtrak. On Blue Beach, the 23rd Marines advance to the town of Sharon Pinoa. Resistance is light. It is seized and they pass on to the phase one line. We have trouble getting our tanks ashore. One company loses 10 of 14 to high surf, enemy action, and wet wiring. Their remaining six are sent to another beach. Five are lost in deep water. One reaches the shore. Five arrive out of 20. Finally, 14 are accumulated and are sent to help the advance near a Fetna point. Five enemy tanks contest the advance. It is ruled no contest. D-Day evening found the 10,000 yard beachhead punched a maximum of 1,500 yards inland. Artillery was up and firing. Tanks and division command posts were ashore. But the situation was far from good. The Japanese still dominated the height and had plenty of artillery and ammunition. Our lines were not integrated and an effort to close a serious gap in them was unsuccessful. Their counterattack is well organized launched in battalion strength. When it is beaten off, 700 Japanese are dead around us. But we were worried. Our progress had slowed too. We had not closed the gap in our lines or gained the heights, and their artillery fire was weakening the effectiveness of our tank. Casualties had reached 3,500. We threw our lone battalion from reserve to combat, and all our troops were committed. If we slowed to this pace, the entire operation was in jeopardy. On D3, the Army Division captures Atleto Airfield and prepares to move against Nafutan Point. Inland, the Marines prepare to attack every one of the myriad strong points which house the enemy position. 500, 790, 600, Tepocho, the Four Pimples, Tipo Poly. Rocket launchers unload their cargoes with telling effect. This cliff dominates the approach to Mount Tepocho. Attempts to move great numbers of troops in the face of its fire would be impossible. Another route must be found to the top. From an observation plane, a road is seen which is not visible from the ground. And we put it to use. One day. Two days. Three days. Four. Six. Eight. Ten days of battle. And enemy 
tanks charge out from the town of Garapan. They do not rejoin their unit. On June 26, we mop up Kagman Peninsula. This shortens our broad front, provides excellent terrain to build an airfield. We have conquered six miles. It has taken us 11 days. Somewhere ahead, in a cave, on a cliff, in a valley, Admiral Nagumo waits and sees the rising tide of destiny that will destroy him. on Tipo Poly still holds out. It continues to defy us for days. The Four Pimples, Flame Tree Hill, Radar Hill, 721, 767, Kiri Gulch, and Paradise Valley. In this misnamed sector of the Inferno, Nagumo has his headquarters. We whittle away. Twelve days. Thirteen. Fourteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Rugged by day. a nightmare of infiltration, banzai, and hand-to-hand -hand combat by night. Each wounded means the loss of nine fighting men. It takes eight to carry him to the rear. In combat, you sense things that you can't always prove. Before the invasion, I had selected the spot where I felt the banzai charge would be made. On D-Day plus 22, all things pointed to its readiness. In the late afternoon, I personally advised my corps of the possibility of a suicidal Banzai charge. When it came, it was the most destructive I ever saw. At 4 a.m. on the morning of July 8, 1944, General Saito's farewell message is read to his troops. Elsewhere on the island, Admiral Nagumo kneels, facing toward the east. The sacrificial knife. Three honorable words. After two years, seven months, and one day, the backwash of Pearl Harbor has inundated its attacker. Thus inspired, 3,000 well-organized and well-directed enemies advance across the railroad right-of-way. American outposts are scattered and overrun. The 1st and 2nd Battalions, 105th Army Infantry, are overwhelmed by sheer weight of numbers. Observers on the heights behold a strange sight. Marching behind the charging riflemen come the halt, the sick, the injured, men on crutches, men in bandages, men without hope, come forth to die. Batteries H and I, 10th Marines, 2nd Division, face the assault with 105 millimeter howitzers. On the enemy comes. The Marines cut their fuses to burst at 150 yards, then 100, then 50, then at muzzle point. But still the enemy comes.
Hastily, the crews decommission their weapons, grab rifles, and retire to fight as infantry as their position is overrun. Then company clerks, messmen, command post personnel, cooks, bakers, messengers, and bandsmen. Fighting Marines first, specialists second. All grab rifles, machine guns, grenades, and retake the lost territory. The Banzai lasts until noon. count, the Army lists 4,311 enemy dead, and we have lost 500. Ratio, 8 to 1. We move into the tedious job of mopping up. Only Marpee Point remains to be taken, and the island will be ours. expended 150,000 artillery shells, 15 million rifle and machine gun shells, 90,000 rounds of mortar fire, and 125,000 hand grenades. As Army and Marine units prepared to hammer the final piston blows on Saipan, we paused. to the civilian population to pass through our lines to freedom and dignity. Mere scores responded. to the enemy soldiers to cease their futile resistance. A handful complied. Others, like this fella, pretended to accept, then tried to kill us with a grenade. We had no recourse but to fight on. sends this man to face death. Pride in his country, its principles, in himself as a man. What sends this exposed American against a hidden enemy? 
history. He walks in the footprints of Valley Forge, the Little Big Horn, Bellow Woods. What sends this man forward when every instinct says, wait? Tradition, his father's yardstick against which he stands to be made. What sends this man through enemy fire to rescue a fallen comrade? Esprit de corps, love of his fellow Marine. What inspires this man, imprisoned by treads of the enemy tank, to render this service above and beyond? Love of country, its righteous cause, lessons learned at his mother's knee. A question abounds in the land. Is our military indoctrination too rugged? This is your son. War has brought him here. War has made him to fight. Will you have him lean and trained and fit, able to defend himself? Or will you, with softness, rob him of confidence and his best chance for survival? As a nation, we have been ferocious in battle. The enemy knew this. In victory, we are forgiving. But on Saipan, hundreds of Japanese civilians and native Shimoras did not believe our guarantees of safe surrender. On the cliffs of Marpy Point, a generation stands. Pleased to surrender are ignored. Into the abyss, fought. Why this senseless suicide? Indoctrination. Since the Japanese occupation in 1914, they've heard lies about American barbarism. Into the abyss, child. Why this needless sacrifice? Indoctrination. Since 1914, they've heard lies about American brutality. Into the abyss, mother. Why indoctrination, lies, hatred, and they have believed. Across a major portion of the world, an iron curtain has descended. And there too, this indoctrination of hatred for our country has begun. Now is no time to weaken our own. So let us teach pride in America. For if you weaken it, incentive dies. Teach our history. For if you delete it, example is lost. Teach our traditions. For if you omit them, comparison vanishes. Build esprit de corps. For if you soften it, the will to win will shrivel. This must never happen to our country. Take the total number of hours or miles a bomber can fly. Divide by two and you have its range. The maximum distance it can reach, deliver its cargo and return to its base. Extend this distance beyond one half, plus gliding ratio times altitude, minus landing approach, and you have disaster. You have exceeded PNR, the point of no return. In mid-1944, our longest range bomber, the B-29, is a yo-yo tied to the string of distance. From Seattle, it can reach impotence. 
and return. From San Francisco, frustration. From Los Angeles, Catalina. Beneath its deadliness lies only the Pacific. From Alaska, the vastness of nowhere is within range. From Hawaii, the friendly island. From Tarawa and the Gilberts, the fringe of the ultimate. But we are still too far away. of any island which supported or could support airfields from which our planes could function was always an item of strategic importance. But two airfield locations captured by the Marines accomplished particularly important objectives in the overall Pacific strategy, enabled us to accelerate our favorable progress and materially shorten the war. Although the Palau campaign was launched several months after those in the Marianas, we will deal first with the field on Peleliu. Here is your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding General Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. Why was this particular one so important, General Smith? Because it lay smack dab on the flank of the planned campaign for the recapture of the Philippines. It was so close to the intended route of approach that its fighter planes could give air cover to its bombers while they were pounding our invasion fleet. It was too far from existing American bases to make permanent neutralization possible. If planes from that field were going to be over our fleet, we wanted them to be ours. It is September 15th, 1944. We storm ashore through heavy enemy fire. This porcupine of jagged coral rises 30 feet above the beach level. From its inaccessible beach face, rifles, machine gun, and a 47 millimeter come to life. We probe for its weakness. Apparently, it has none. Assault from the beach is impossible. The rifle platoon assigned to deal with it fights inland, then executes a turning movement to take it from the landward side. Underbrush protecting their rifle pits is burned away. Resistance is fierce and stubborn. The support platoon is committed. Firefight, they annihilate the four pillboxes mounting heavy enemy machine guns. The fifth, the principal installation, is a powerful reinforced casemate built into the coral near the base of the cliff. It withstands repeated assault. Here is in place the 47 millimeter gun which has been creating havoc on the landing beach. one opening, they pop up at another.
but every such installation must have an air vent. Alone, exposed. A lieutenant, the surviving platoon leader, dodges forward. Missed by a score of riflemen, he drops a smoke grenade to cover the approach. A corporal launches a rifle grenade into the firing aperture. It strikes the gun barrel, knocking the weapon out of action and igniting something inflammable. No one pushed this man into this deed of bravery. He was driven to it by that intangible something inside that so frequently explodes the ordinary into the realm of greatness. He could not settle for less. He was fighting for so much more. He was a Marine. As we push forward in the center, the terrain is favorable for maneuver. We move toward our 01 phase line. Here we tie in. Partly because of the action similar to that at the Coral Hill, which is retarding the drive on the left, and partly because of the heavy artillery fire, which sweeps the airfield from the high ground to the north. Shortly after noon, pillboxes slow our advance. Tanks have been coming ashore since 20 minutes after the initial landings. We call for assistance. Pending the arrival of the tanks, Amtraks lend supporting fire and are hit. The area is cleared and we move forward. Other units move north, across the exposed runways. As we progress, the enemy artillery fire is intensified. Then we get a break. Tanks moving up in support of I Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, are obliged to skirt the southern edge of the airfield to avoid an anti-tank ditch. Our unit is I Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. When their driver asks if we are I Company, we say yes. Together, we move forward. Later, the mistake is rectified. At 4.50 p.m., the enemy makes a tank infantry sortie across the northern portions of the airfield. Concerted efforts wipe out both tanks and infantry. Repeated smaller attacks are beaten off. By nightfall, we own one half of the airfield. Dawn brings increased artillery fire from the enemy. Deadly fire pours from the flank installations in the woods and scrub jungle. As we reach the main service apron and hangar area, we encounter Japanese resistance in strength. By the night of September 16, 1944, 
the airfield is in our possession. By the 28th of September, the enemy on Peleliu had been compressed into that last pocket of bitter resistance. But artillery fire from nearby Casivas was taking a toll of the Marines. To clear this island and also secure the fighter strip which it supported, a shore-to-shore -shore operation was planned. across the strait lies the enemy-held island. Tanks, Amtrak's armored, and LVTs are assigned the mission. To protect our concentration point, Marine planes begin the strafing, which will not lift until we are 90 feet from the enemy beach. the landing force, flanked by the LVTAs, followed by the LVTs, filled with the assault troops. Three of the tanks swamp. LVTAs spearhead the landing and furnish covering fire. progress are disposed. cleared, artillery begins construction of a position. One Marine is 
wounded, lies exposed to enemy fire. A tank covers while his buddies rescue him. Some of us administer first aid. Others go after the sniper. Clutching a grenade, he darts from his concealment. The capture of the airfield on Peleliu and the fighter strip on Gesebus secured and anchored the right flank of what would be the drive into the Philippines. Now we knew that any aircraft flying from either of these fields would provide friendly air cover, if needed, for the invasion at Leyte. The other field, which had such a far-reaching historical and strategic effect, was located on Tinian in the Marianas. And what was its special significance, General Smith? Its location. It would place Tokyo directly beneath our bomb sites. This would enable us to bring a taste of war to the Japanese home islands, destruction to her war production facilities, and weaken her internal morale. It would breach the inner defense circle. It was the beginning of the end. It is July 25th, 1944. The island is Tinian. The day is D plus two. The objective, airfields number one and three. As our unit presses farther to the north, Resistance develops along the coast. Enemy survivors of last night's savage counterattack are holed up in the craggy coral. In about three seconds, one of the enemy will dart along the crest and try to kill our cameraman. By 11.15, our advance is bogged to a virtual standstill in the face of a knotty core of opposition near the water's edge. The rugged terrain makes tank support impracticable. Armored amphibians, due to the shore's configuration, cannot hit the area with their fire. pivots to the left, wheels in an arc to the beach. Within 15 minutes, a pocket of 20 to 25 well-concealed riflemen is reduced. At 11.30, one battalion attacks eastward toward the build-up area around Yushi Point Airfield and the airstrip itself.
In victory, to the world, they are magnificent. To themselves, just sweaty. To them, it is a few hundred feet of concrete. To the Joint Chiefs of Staff, each foot has been projected into thousands of aerial miles. To the Marines, it is a stinking island, pitted and defaced by explosive agonies. A receptacle of bitter memory. To the planners in high echelon, it is this. And this. And this. And eventually, this. These scenes, they do not see. Today, their only realization is a victory, and the rest so arduously won. Our B-29 is still a yo-yo, tied to the string of distance. But they have extended the string. They are Marines.